Our next speaker is um, Dr. Yair Blumenfeld, and he's an associate professor um, in the uh, Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine and Department of OBGYN here at Stanford. He's also the, uh, the director of the fetal therapies. Um, he finished medical school at Sackler and then went to, um, to do his OBGYN residency at Mount Sinai in New York. And following that, he came to Stanford. Um, his areas of research interest are broad and include um, fetal therapy for CDH, which he's going to be speaking about today. Thank you, um, Chris, and thank you, David, for inviting me. This is really an honor to sit among very distinguished uh, clinicians, physician scientists, and uh, scientists uh, broadly. Um, the topic I was uh, charged with today is the prenatal challenges that we all have in managing CDH, and I share these challenges with several people in this room when we have cases that are referred to us. And so this is going to be predominantly a clinical talk. Um, I hope to outline some of the prenatal imaging challenges that we have when we deal with CDH um, to describe current controversies related to prenatal therapy for CDH and in some future directions. Um, so I think this was highlighted in the previous talks. <clears throat> CDH is a rather rare disease um, and it's detected in about two-thirds of cases in the prenatal period, meaning about a third are actually not detected, uh, even though of course almost every pregnant patient has a <coughs> ultrasound in the second trimester. And we can even see it in the first trimester. So in the top picture, you see a normal four-chamber view of the heart in the first trimester. And then the picture below, you can see the stomach at the same level of the fetal heart, and the heart is clearly pushed off to the side. Uh, and in about 20 to 30% of the cases, we can identify an associated genetic syndrome, not so much as the necessarily the cause, as was just described, but the associated syndromes. Uh, and this is particularly important for us on the prenatal management side because we want to be able to prognosticate outcomes, and we know that if there is an associated genetic syndrome, clearly the prognosis is going to be quite more guarded. Uh, most women nowadays undergo some sort of prenatal genetic screening, usually focused on Down syndrome and trisomy 18, nowadays with much more uh, efficient tools using cell-free DNA. But you can see that the, uh, there's still a very broad list of associated genetic syndromes that are going to be missed if one only uh, utilizes cell-free DNA, and that's why we encourage every pregnant patient where we find a fetal anomaly, particularly one as severe as CDH, to undergo amniocentesis with microarray testing. Um, I think that pathophysiology is well known and was described in the previous talk, but um, clearly I think the major outcome of having the viscera herniate into the fetal thorax is there's clearly a disruption of the alveoli leading to pulmonary hypoplasia and then the vasculature leading to pulmonary hypertension. And on the neonatal side, I don't have to describe to this audience, uh, clearly there's a significant associated morbidity and mortality. The mortality uh, ranges depending on the size of the defect and where it's located and associated syndromes. And then even in survivors, uh, we encounter long, or you guys encounter long-term problems that can even lead to mortality later on in life. Um, Clearly, it's no surprise that the size of the defect matters. <clears throat> and these are um, studies where pediatric surgeons go into the fetal thorax in the neonatal period and, of course, quantify the size of the defect. And it's not surprising that the larger the defect, the more significant the morbidity, in this particular case, vis-a-vis uh, -vis days on ventilation and days of hospitalization. Um, this is from the CDH uh, study group, which I think uh, Chris is a member of. Um, and looking at which factors can prognostic, uh, prognosticate survival. And not surprisingly, uh, cases that are diagnosed prenatally uh, were associated with increased um, mortality. And the reason for that is probably because they were more severe. Uh, something about the liver herniating into the thorax um, leads to worse outcomes. And we know, and I think this, it was interesting to hear about the CPEM talk earlier, when we look at the fetal lung with CDH, there's something about CDH that is quite different from other space-occupying lesions in the lung, which leads to even worse pulmonary hypoplasia and pulmonary hypertension. And it's not just about the um, size of the lung uh, lesion. Uh, clearly, chromosome anomalies are going to be associated with worse outcomes, uh, whether the anomaly is isolated or not. Um, in this group, interestingly, uh, a non-left-sided defect was not associated with mortality, although other studies have shown that right-sided CDH is associated with worse morbidity and mortality. Uh, prematurity confers increased uh, mortality risk, and then evidence of pulmonary hypertension on the first neonatal echo. 
Um, this is an example of what a right-sided CDH looks like. Um, and this is important because, again, the right-sided CDH has been shown to have worse outcomes. And unfortunately, these lesions are missed more often. And the reason for that is when one uh, encounters a left-sided CDH, the four-chamber view of the heart is altered dramatically due to mediastinal shift. And when you have a right-sided CDH, the heart is not pushed away from its normal position. It's actually pushed off more to the left. And so what you can see on the top image is the heart, um, and I can use a pointer, pushed a little bit more to the left-hand side. This whole area here is the liver. This is the res residual contralateral lung. And what you see in the cine clip below is when the heart is shown, you can actually identify a diaphragm in the stomach right below that. And then when you're sweeping towards that right side, you can see that the entire liver is in the thoracic cavity. Um, so what do we do when we are either referred or diagnosed a fetus with congenital diaphragmatic hernia? First of all, it's very important for us to diagnose the lesion. And I can tell you at Packard and uh, many other advanced centers, we have very robust and um, standardized way of identifying the diaphragm in the prenatal period. This is clearly an anomaly we do not want to miss. We are not perfect. We have missed these, of course. We're only human. Uh, but once we identify these, we want to make sure we're speaking the same language with our neonatal colleagues, with our pediatric surgeons, and of course with the family. So we want to identify the lesion and determine, first of all, how severe is the lesion. And so how do you quantify severity of a lesion that you cannot actually see. So you can't actually see, we can't actually go into the diaphragm and say, oh, the hole is a centimeter wide, or the hole is two centimeters wide. So we use various proxy measurements for that. So we want to talk about the location, we want to talk about what is being put where, and we want to use the imaging tools that we do have, especially ultrasound and MRI, to quantify the, um, the uh, size of the defect, and then, of course, to rule out associated genetic syndromes. And so we start using these imaging tools, um, and so we want to determine whether or not the lesion is on the left or the right-hand side. And really, the standard uh, sonographic measurement for CDH is something called the lung-head ratio, which is actually the lung area to head circumference, not the lung area to head area. Um, and you can do that by looking at the contralateral lung right behind the four-chamber view of the heart. And so in this image here, you can see this is the heart pushed off to the side, and here is the liver, and here is the residual lung here. And then this bottom image where you can see the stomach and the bowel at the same area as the four-chamber view, this is the contralateral lung area here. And of course, with MRI, our neonatology colleagues love seeing the MRIs because for some reason it shows much nicer than ultrasound. Clearly, there's a defect here where the you know, portion of the liver is herniated into the thorax. Um, so we try to quantify the area of the lung, the contralateral lung, and um, there are three different methods of doing that. Um, the historical way is to use a cross-section view of the uh, thorax and to do what's called the anterior-posterior measurement, where a line is dissected across that lung, both in the anterior and the vertical and the horizontal position. Um, and then people realize, well, if you're going to start looking at that, not every contralateral lung is going to be a perfect circle. And so what do you do when you have a tear shape kind of a lung? And then people said, well, use the longest. So instead of going anti vertical and horizontal, use whatever the longest is. And then eventually said, well, why are you doing that? If it's not even a perfect tear shape, just do a circumference. And up until recently, there was a big debate about which one of these to use. And I'll um, talk about that a little bit more. But be that as it may, once you obtain a lung head ratio, you can then quantify what the observed to expected lung head ratio is. And this is from Jacques Janis' group in Europe. And you can see that when they looked at left-sided uh, lesions on the uh, histogram on the left and the right-sided lesions, once you got to left-sided isolated lesions, if you had an observed to expected lung head ratio less than 35%, survival dropped significantly to about 50 to 60%, and then less than 25, survival was about 30% or less. When you look at right-sided lesions, survival below 45% observed to expected lung head ratio was essentially zero in this particular cohort. Um, this is um, Rodrigo Ruano's data from Brazil. Uh, he compared babies that survived versus those that did not, and the average lung head ratio in his group was about one in the mortality group and about 2.2 in the alive group, and the observed to expected was significantly lower in the um, death group, of course, versus the uh, living group. And then he also showed that you're able to use the observed to expected lung head ratio to also prognosticate 
uh, pulmonary hypertension. We can, of course, argue about how the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension was made. But be that as it may, clearly there's a big uh, prognostic value to the observed to expected lung head ratio, probably for some lung pulmonary function, not just mortality. Um, we can get quite fancy with ultrasound, too. This is a relatively older study. The equipment now is even better, but we can uh, obtain something called a vascular index using advanced 3D ultrasound. Uh, this hasn't quite taken off, but you can actually um, essentially quantify the vascularity in a lung, um, primarily for research purposes at this point. And in this study, the association was with pulmonary hypertension in survivors. Um, another a uh, prognostic method that we use now because it's simple is stomach position. Um, and this came uh, from a group in France. And essentially, they graded the position of the stomach within the fetal thorax to prognosticate survival. And so grade one, the stomach is not visualized. It's below the diaphragm. Grade two, the stomach is in the anterior position, touching the anterior uh, chest wall. Grade three, it's in the uh, mid position. And then grade four is in the posterior position. And essentially, this is another proxy for the degree of liver herniation. And so, for example, in grade four, you can see that the entire thorax on this side is occupied by the fetal liver. And they show that when you uh, perform this kind of grade, grading, even in isolation, you can uh, associate it with both survival. And on the uh, right-hand side, this was uh, fetuses that were treated with tracheal occlusion, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, more appropriate assessment of the lung probably involves an MRI. And so rather than looking at a simple two-dimensional view of a contralateral lung, uh, we can use MRI in various slice thicknesses to try to quantify the total lung volume. And so um, we partner with our radiology colleagues to do that. And so at this point, you're no longer just looking at one lung. You're looking at both lungs. And of course, you're not just looking at a single slice, but multiple slices over time. And so um, when you use an observed to expect a total lung volume, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the association with survival. And generally speaking, there's a big drop off when you, once you get to observed to expect a total lung volume less than 35 in this cohort, usually around 30. Um, and then uh, you can see the association with an observed to expect a total lung volume by MRI on the right-hand side in terms of the need for oxygenation um, in the immediate neonatal uh, period. Uh, so putting this all together, um, you can see that in this uh, table taken from this manuscript, looking at both survival and need for ECMO as a proxy for uh, pulmonary hyperplasia, um, you can see that the uh, comparison between neonates that survived versus died, clearly those that died had a higher incidence of liver herniation. The average lung head ratio was significantly lower. Uh, the observed to expected lung head ratio in the death group was about 38% versus 51%. Um, and the uh, total lung volumes uh, observed to expected, you can see, was about 26% uh, in the demise group and the, uh, f about 40% in the survival group. And similar uh, differences were seen in the need for ECMO after delivery. Um, and then the same group, this is from Texas Children's. I know there was somebody here from TCH. Um, they tried to figure out which one is actually the best prognostic value uh, in this cohort, and it ended up being the uh, observed to expected total lung volume was slightly better than ultrasound, uh, despite my um, objection, um, and um, with an AOC of 0.78. So again, not perfect, but potentially slightly better. And so I can tell you here at uh, Packard, when we have um, children referred for CDH, our approach is, of course, to use both ultrasound, MRI. We try to quantify the percent liver herniation and use all those uh, parameters together when we sit down and then present the data to the family. So let's talk a little bit about uh, fetal therapy for severe CDH cases. Um, but before we do that, just a quick primer on when to perform fetal therapy in general, because of course we have two patients, and essentially anytime we do a in utero therapy, we're by de facto harming a healthy pregnant mother. And so the anomaly has to be severe, potentially life-threatening for the neonate, uh, resulting in severe neonatal morbidity and mortality. And I think we would all agree that CDH is that kind of a lesion. Uh, we want to make sure the anomaly is isolated without associated genetic syndrome so that our intervention clearly addresses the functional or the anatomical uh, abnormality, that there's sufficient human or animal, ideally both, data to uh, suggest proven benefit. Um, we want to make sure that the risks to the mother are known. Clearly, we're going through very vascular organs, i.e. the uterus, potentially harming the placenta as well, and that everybody's 
well-informed and counseled. And as you can imagine, what pregnant mother is not going to say, please do everything possible for my underborn baby, knowing that she's taking on full risk. So we have to be very careful with our inherent enthusiasm for performing fetal therapies. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have IRB protocols for various investigational methods. Uh, we want to make sure we're addressing any maternal comorbidity. Uh, we want to assess technical factors such as placenta location and whether or not the gestational age makes sense. And this is particularly important, as you'll see, if we're thinking about lung development in utero and what stage of development are we really intervening on and is it really going to make a difference in the outcome. And then, of course, determine the risk of prematurity because anytime we intervene, we're going to increase the risk of that. Uh, outcome where we know that preterm babies born with CDH clearly have worse outcomes. So this is an example of somebody who's not a candidate for fetal therapy. This was us trying to assess the cervical length on this patient where we used transvaginal ultrasound. You can see the fetal head here. And the cervix didn't quite look well. And, and I said to the sonographer, please advance it a little more so we can get a better picture. And then she was over here a second later. I said, oh, it doesn't quite look like a cervix. Looks maybe a little short. Advance a little more. And we were essentially touching the fetal head. And this woman was five centimeters dilated as we're evaluating her for fetal therapy and delivered within five or six hours thereafter. So clearly not a candidate for fetal therapy. Um, so this was the original uh, fetal therapy approach. So this came out of UCSF uh, by pediatric surgeons who said maybe we can perform a primary repair for CDH. And so um, a hysterotomy, first of all, a laparotomy was made, of course, to expose the uterus. Then a hysterotomy, i.e. a uterine incision was made. The baby was exposed, the diaphragm was isolated and repaired primarily. And as you can imagine, especially you know, now almost 30 years ago, women did poorly and babies did very poorly. Very high risk of preterm premature rupture membranes, very high risk of prematurity. Many of these babies did not survive the uh, initial surgery, let alone the prematurity that was associated with it. And so Dr. Harrison um, uh, and his colleagues then went back to the drawing board. Um, and they said, well, maybe we can actually do this procedure without opening the fetal chest. And they recognized very astutely that there's normal egress of fluid coming out of the lung. And maybe if you obstructed the trachea, you can actually uh, enhance the uh, growth of the lung because the fluid will build up within the thorax. And so you'll get lung growth. And what they showed was that you can actually go in and, again, perform a hysterotomy and a laparotomy. But instead of making uh, an incision on the neonatal or the fetal chest, um, you then actually obstructed the trachea. So they went in, dissected the trachea, closed it, and put the baby back in, and literally watched the lung grow via ultrasound after doing that. Now, I don't have to tell the people in the room this, that you can imagine that the most important part of this surgery is then going to be to remove the obstruction of the trachea, okay? Because clearly that is very, very important for transition from in utero life to neonatal life. And this was a big problem with these surgeries. Um, and then they said, well, maybe we can do this even without performing a hysterotomy and a laparotomy. And they realized that they can actually perform something called fetoscopy, where they insert a fetoscope, like a camera with a tube, into the, in this case, the original sheep studies. And they can go in and actually plug the trachea instead of just making a uh, um, suture tie. And they did this quite successfully. And then um, Rodrigo Ruano, who then saw this and went back to Brazil, did some of the initial studies on this. And you can actually, you can see through the mom's abdomen using ultrasound, you don't need to make uh, an incision anymore. You can just put in this fetoscope and you can literally just intubate a fetus while it's still inside mom. And you can see the anatomy. You can see the epiglottis here. You can see the vocal cords. And then you can advance this fetoscope beyond the vocal cords into the trachea and dislodge a um, balloon which was originally invented for obstructing cranial aneurysms. And so people adopted that balloon, a vascular balloon, to use for in utero therapy to plug the trachea. Um, and this is what it kind of looks like. So this is a fetoscopy. You can see the mouth is upside down, and here's the balloon. And there's a little one-way valve that once you insert the balloon into the trachea, you can inject some fluid, which will not be uh, removed, and it sort of allows the lung to grow. Um, and you can actually follow the uh, contralateral lung again using lung head area once you put the balloon in. And you can see in this view, a sagittal view, you can see the balloon is within the trachea, and you can actually identify appropriate position of the balloon as well after feto. 
Um, and this is what a uh, balloon removal looks like. Um, so uh, again, you can see the fetoscope is now inside the uterine cavity, um, slowly making its way uh, towards the um, back of the tongue. Um, I don't do any tracheoscopies or, or anything like that in the neonatal period. You can imagine that this takes a little bit of uh, skill and brute force in the fetal period. Um, mom is under general anesthesia. Uh, the baby is obviously well positioned the best you can. Um, and then through multiple attempts using um, also some amnio uh, injection or fluid injection, you can open up various cavities that are uh, not typically open to allow you to have good visualization. Now the balloon is typically uh, inserted around 26 to 28 weeks, so you're already in the third trimester. And of course, as you can imagine, it's very important to remove the balloon prior to delivery, and that happens at about 34 to 35 weeks. Ideally, of course, before the onset of labor, because if a balloon is left inside, as I'll show you with some data soon, uh, you can end up with similar outcomes. And so um, there's a lot of uh, thinking about what is the appropriate time period for putting and removing these types of balloons. And so you can see the fetoscope slowly making its way down. Uh, oftentimes you end up in the esophagus uh, because getting to the trachea is more difficult. Uh, and then eventually you make yourself down the trachea and you can see a balloon there. And through the fetoscope, there's a working channel uh, through which you can then insert a needle and pop this balloon. Now this balloon has been sitting there for about two months. There's a lot of pressure within the lung and once the uh, needle is popped or the balloon is popped with a needle, you can then almost not even take it out yourself. It'll come out by itself, but usually a grasper is used to uh, remove the balloon and um, you'll see a needle coming uh, over on this side in a second. Uh, but in the interest of time, spoiler alert, the balloon's removed in this case, okay? <laughs> Um, and so this is um, one of the original um, uh, randomized studies. This is from Brazil. Again, they didn't really have access to ECMO in this particular hospital, uh, but a randomized trial where uh, Rodrigo used a lung head ratio less than one, of course, didn't have MRI in this particular institution. And you can see that the survival in this group, in the FETO group, was about 50% versus 5% of controls, and pulmonary hypertension was um, significantly reduced as well. Um, Groups out of Europe, particularly Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Spain, and a group in France uh, really kind of um, uh, embellished the uh, experience with this. And this was a study uh, now almost 10 years ago uh, that showed the initial experience with 210 cases with severe CDH. Uh, again, in Europe, they didn't use MRI. Uh, at this point, they didn't even use an observed to expect lung head ratio, just a lung head ratio. And they showed that they were able to put in the balloon in 97% of the cases. And what they showed was that they, in left-sided lesions, when they used these criteria for CDH, um, for who to intervene on, they had a 54% survival versus a historical control of 24%. So again, they used a historical control. They said, if we weren't going to intervene, we would have 24% survival. If we are going to intervene, we'll have 50% survival. With right-sided lesions, they showed a survival rate of 35% versus a historical control that had 0%. And this really launched um, many, many groups uh, starting to perform uh, FETO for CDH. But what are the risks? So out of 210 cases, they had 47% preterm premature membrane rupture, which is not a big deal if you've already taken out the balloon, but is a big deal if you have membrane rupture after you inserted the balloon before you took the balloon out. Because you need that amniotic fluid to then allow you to do fetoscopy to take out the balloon. Uh, taking out the balloon could be tricky. Um, 146 out of 210 were taken out in the prenatal period, meaning about fit, you know, 60, we relied on the neonatal colleagues to then take it out. Um, 106 were taken out by fetoscopy, 40 by ultrasound guided puncture, meaning they couldn't take it out by fetoscopy. And so they then did an ultrasound through mom's abdomen where they guided a needle directly into the trachea to try to pop the balloon. Uh, 14 uh, cases required emergency exit procedure. That's when we're in such duress that we have to deliver the baby by cesarean delivery, deliver the baby's head, keep the, bo the body of the baby inside, getting blood from the placenta, and have our neonatal colleagues perform tracheoscopies to take out the balloon, because otherwise the baby's gonna die. 56% uh, had an emergency procedure, um, and then four babies actually had an unexplained death after putting the balloon in not trying to take it out, but they put a balloon in, everything was fine for some reason, the baby died. Um, and then most importantly, 
Uh, in about 10 out of the 210 cases, they actually had a neonatal demise, meaning they tried everything, fetoscopy, exit, ultrasound guided, ENT, and they could not get the balloon out, and you can imagine how uh, catastrophic that was. Um, and this launched the um, now rather famous total trial, uh, primarily out of Europe, where they're randomizing women to balloon versus no balloon. Uh, and they actually have two criteria. They have a severe, or two arms, excuse me. They have a severe arm and then they have a moderate arm. So the severe criteria is um, an observed to expected lung head ratio by ultrasound. Again, MRI is not a criteria. Measured at the latest at 29 and five, meaning you don't have to put even the balloon before 29 weeks. You just have to identify and randomize them. So for those in the audience interested in lung development in utero and thinking about the stages, what kind of difference are you really making when you're putting the balloons at such an advanced gestational age? Uh, the moderate criteria are even more lax, where you have an observed to expected ratio. You actually have two different mechanisms depending on not you have liver herniation. And here the measurement is allowed all the way up to 32 weeks, meaning you can actually place a balloon at 32, 33 weeks for only a few weeks if you are randomized to this study. The trial started in 2011. Uh, very slow recruitment, and so they opened it up to other U.S. centers. Um, and there's a, they planned on 196 patients, and there's a planned interim analysis this summer to see whether or not to continue. Um, and going back to how the, um, this is one of the challenges, going back to how to even measure lung area, in the trial, they actually allow for three different methods of identifying whether or not somebody is a candidate. You can either use the circumferential method, the longest method, or the AP diameter. Um, and more interest, or as interestingly, you can see that once they take out the balloon, if they're able to, the patient can actually go into the referring center. Now, it's one thing if the patient's coming from a tertiary academic center, it's a whole other thing if the patient then goes back to a country that has less than appropriate uh, technical capabilities. And so both of these are quite problematic. Um, this is the, these are the data uh, upon which they predicated the trial uh, and observed to expected lung head ratio and survival. And again, they used essentially a historical control for that. Um, this is all from their website. You can review that. Um, and then over the last year, we actually participated in a study through the North American Fetal Therapy Network where several investigators said, wait, if you can use three different methods, shouldn't we maybe study the inter-observer variability on how to measure the lung area? And lo and behold, uh, about 15 or so centers were actually sent various images, and both maternal fetal medicine specialists and radiology uh, uh, specialists were actually asked to measure the lung by various measurements, both with uh, total trial centers and other non-total trial centers, but people with expertise in uh, diagnosing CDH. And lo and behold, the highest or the best inter-observer agreement was with the circumferential method. Okay? There's a subsequent study, which uh, I can't present the data, but it's under consideration, where actually they looked at the total trial um, uh, centers, and there was broad variability or pretty large variability between the methods that different centers recruiting for the trial are using. So some centers are using the circumferential method, some centers are using AP. So already this trial is kind of wishy-washy in terms of the agreement between the centers about who to even enroll. Um, we kept hearing from our neonatology colleagues that these outcome data cannot be right. The survival just seems too low. And so we, we looked at our uh, Packer data uh, in isolated CDH cases, and we presented this at the recent uh, SMFM uh, uh, meeting, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. This was a collaborative study between MFM, radiology, and neonatology. And we used the same criteria that the total trial uses, albeit with smaller numbers. And what we saw when we looked at survival to discharge using the same total criteria, we saw that out of nine uh, cases, we had a survival to discharge of about 80% or close to 80% in the severe range, 75%, albeit with four uh, cases. And then when we looked at even the mild, we clearly had some mortality in that group. And interestingly, when we went there and presented this, there was also a group from Johns Hopkins that presented, and I know there was somebody from Hopkins here, or of course, uh, earlier, uh, they presented their initial experience with about 10 uh, fetal cases, and they showed that when they performed fetal in severe uh, cases where they expected, of course, the survival to be 50%, their survival rate was about 70 to 80%. So even though we, we showed without therapy, they showed with therapy, clearly there's a range in terms of 
baseline expected neonatal survival, depending on what kind of expertise you have. And clearly, this lung to head ratio is quite problematic in terms of screening for who should undergo this very invasive therapy. Um, so I alluded to the fact that this balloon is a little problematic, uh, particularly in terms of being able to place it and remove it and having complications between the interval of placing and removing. And um, a friend of ours, Nicholas Sinanis, who's uh, a great guy, spent some time at TCH, um, lives in Strasbourg, France, and about five miles away from his university, there's an amazing primate center which looks like Jurassic Park. These monkeys, if you have a chance, I highly recommend going, especially for, since everybody's interested in lung development. And you know, I, I thought I would go to some crazy laboratory where these monkeys are underground and chained and just horrific stories. And I, and I get there and it's outdoor trees that you could barely see the fence and these monkeys are flying back and forth. And be that, be that as may, you know, he's able to perform fetoscopies in these monkeys. And you can see the images on the left look like the fetoscopy that I showed you when you put a balloon in. So, of course, you can get you know, nice images of a fetal monkey eye, and you can see the trachea, and you can see the bifurcation of the trachea. And then you can even put in a balloon. And so you can simulate putting in a balloon in a pregnant monkey. The amniotic cavity is a little different, and of course, a smaller abdomen, but a little disbelief, and you feel like you're performing surgery on a human. And so he developed this balloon. He said, if the problem is taking out the balloon, what if there's a way to take out the balloon non-invasively? And so he created a balloon that has a magnet on the balloon, so you inflate it, and then to deflate the balloon, all you need to do is put the patient through an MRI machine, and then the magnet gets disassociated, and from the pressure, the balloon will just come out. And lo and behold, he did this, and so over here you can see a pregnant fetal monkey. Uh, this is x-ray, he didn't need IRB. Um, and well, he needed IRB, but not you, you know, to do the x-ray. And you can see here's the balloon in the monkey trachea, right here, this little line. And then over here, this is after the MRI machine, you can see the little balloon is no longer in the trachea. And so right now he's uh, performing uh, more of these studies. He's collecting tracheal aspirates to see the effects on uh, tracheal fluid. And there's already uh, discussions in Europe because it's easier to do this in, in humans. Um, as you can imagine, you uh, need quite a lot of technical expertise and experience to do this. It's not simple, and there's an amazing fetal model in, um, in uh, Toronto where it looks like a simple rubber uh, baby on the outside, but the inside, which unfortunately I don't have a video of, it's remarkably similar to a human trachea, and they actually developed this model using 3D renderings, and um, people go there and actually uh, simulate uh, doing these procedures. Um, I think the prior talk, um, I'm not going to do this justice, but obviously there are a lot of molecular mechanisms that we don't understand yet. Um, I included just an endothelin-1, um, which I think was highlighted in the prior talk as well. I won't go into depth, but the idea is that clearly when you do FETO, we're expanding the lung, but we have no idea what it's doing to alveoli, what it's doing molecularly, how it's affecting uh, pulmonary function. Um, and so people are starting to do that, um, to look at that. And so this is an example of a rat model using sildenafil, which of course uh, is a, a potent vasodilator. And you can see in this uh, rat model, here's the control, and here's a CDH model where they used uh, uh, chemotherapy essentially to induce uh, CDH. And you can see uh, this is the control uh, sildenafil group, and this, this is the alveoli using sildenafil, which more closely mimics the alveoli in the uh, control placebo group. And then when they looked at the musculature of the arteries, you can see again, this is the um, placebo in the CDH group versus the sildenafil effects on the vasculature. And then uh, there's a lot of work uh, now being performed in trying to determine how to get these uh, medications essentially into the developing lung once we identify things that work. Uh, here's an example of uh, stem cell therapy. Uh, again, different ways of getting those in. Um, but here's a control group where you can see a normal appearing lung. This is a CDH. This was a surgically created model. You can see um, much more compressed uh, alveoli and thickening of the um, endothelial layers of the uh, arteries. This is CDH with tracheal occlusion, uh, which more mimics the control. And then finally, the best outcome was seen with CDH, tracheal occlusion, and stem cell therapy. And people are looking at this as well. And then finally, this was um, from Cincinnati with Jose Luis Perot, uh, where um, they used an oven model now 
to perform tracheal CDH, surgically uh, created CDH model, and then to do tracheal occlusion and collecting tracheal aspirates before and after the tracheal occlusion to better understand the molecular phenotypes of these uh, interventions. I didn't include all the uh, images in this paper. This just came out about a week ago, but I highly recommend looking at that because I think for many people in this room, I think you'll see many uh, correlates to the neonatal period and hopefully potential targets that we can then go in with various fetal therapy mechanisms. And so in summary, uh, I think we need to standardize prenatal imaging in CDH so we're all talking the same language. Uh, we need to pay more attention to center-specific outcomes when we're thinking about who to intervene on and how. Uh, we need to identify appropriate candidates. And then we need to, or we're relying on many people in this room and even beyond to help us identify uh, additional therapeutic measures beyond just growing a lung. How do we uh, grow an actual functional lung? And that will require some medical therapy, not just surgical therapy. So thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful um, summary of what's going on in fetal therapy for CDH. Um, so questions from the audience? Dr. Bland. Yes, uh, the answer is yes. You know, there's some debate about when to give the beta methasone, um, you know, and how tracheal occlusion affects type 2 pneumocytes, and there's still debate. But yeah, invariably, these patients receive beta methasone, and nobody's really, I don't think, looked at the effect of that vis a vis tracheal occlusion and the timing of that yet. Kristen. might affect the uh, initiation and regulation or maturation of the fetal breathing movements. Fetal breathing movements that in utero, you mean? Yeah, because I think they initiate during fetal life uh, around the same time. Yeah, I haven't seen anything related to, to that. You know, it's fetal breathing as, you know, we, we use it as a proxy for fetal well-being and we study it. Some babies, you know, we can see fetal, what's called fetal breathing, essentially movement of the diaphragm up and down. Um, and some babies we see it quite early on, some babies later. I'm saying even in normal fetuses, it's, I, I haven't seen anything yeah, where they've the looked at. Profile. Right, no, but, but sometimes you can see it at 26 weeks, and if you don't see it at 26 weeks, we say, well, that's normal, and then if you don't see it at like 34, 35 weeks, we say that's abnormal. But we, we don't, I haven't seen anything related to CDH and fetal breathing or tracheal occlusion. And the reason I bring that up is that there's some, um, uh, in vivo mouse models now showing that the mechanical factors, the stretch and um, movement in utero is actually important for maturation of alveolar uh, cells mm. and um, alveolar epithelial cells. So I don't know, it may be worth thinking about how to yeah, integrate thank that. Thank you, that's, a, that's, that's really interesting. interesting. Thank you. Thank you.